getting up uh, this early. Um, so I'm going to just set the stage uh, for long duration storage. Remind you the spectacular progress that has been made in um, renewable energy. A con a, see concentrated solar offshore wind. Uh, the red line is the rough uh, wholesale price of fossil fuel, natural gas, for example. Uh, onshore wind, solar voltaic are dipping below that. Uh, and even offshore wind in a decade or two might come below that. So that's great news. So what's the problem? The problem is uh, getting just below levelized uh, cost of electricity is not enough. It probably has to be about twofold below uh, because there has to be increased energy storage, enhanced transmission distribution, and backup generating capacity if you're run out of uh, even long duration. And long duration uh, we will define as anything more than three days. Um, so anyway, so let's talk about energy storage. Um, this is the article uh, that Jimmy talked about, long duration electricity storage. And just to summarize this article, they were comparing it to natural gas peaking plants and how, what would have to be the cost to be competitive natural gas peaking plants. And they decided, yeah, 10 or $20 a kilowatt hour would be good enough. Uh, what is it now? It's about $200 a kilowatt hour if you're generous, $300 if you pay the full bill, and, uh, and maybe 2,000 times more than we have today. So that's the challenge. This is the long duration storage uh, battery. Um, and so when uh, you have renewable energy, you pump water up a hill, in this case from underground uh, to a water tower for irrigation. And uh, it's currently 95% of all electrical storage around the world and 95% of the US. <clears throat> so if you look at the time scales of what you need, uh, we're gonna focus on the upper right-hand corner uh, and that's you know, power to gas. Uh, you're thinking of pump hydro storage, uh, compressed air energy storage. Um, which has been around for a long time, but so far no one has been able to make commercially viable compressed air storage. Uh, there's a difference between compressing air and compressing water. It has to do with physics. Uh, the work done is force times distance. Uh, when you pump, move an incompressible fluid, uh, the distance is solely in lifting something up and you get it back. Uh, when you're pumping a gas, you're compressing the gas. And that's a real problem. And so for that reason, even though it sounds good in principle, it, it hasn't taken off. So pumped hydro storage is the dominant form. Uh, one is looking at hydrogen and other things. And uh, sorry about that. <clears throat> and then down here you see thermal storage, and I'll say a few words about that. So what's the pumped hydro storage capacity around the world? It's led by China, the United States, Japan. Um, the United States has received applications to build uh, an additional 18.9 gigawatts. Uh, so pump storage comes in two units. It's power and uh, energy storage. So gigawatts is the power, uh, 18 gigawatts, and you have you know, the corresponding gigawatt hours. That's good. That would increase it by 1.9, but these are just applications, and maybe, if we're lucky, half of them will be built. So that's the US, if all goes well. Uh, what about China? Uh, China's over here. What's that over here? Uh, they're playing 270 gigawatts. So that stretches uh, outside the building. And, uh, and they're more serious about this. And so um, they will have more pumped storage than the rest of the world combined maybe by twofold, but certainly more than the rest of the world combined. And uh, you know, having said that, when you have pump storage, uh, only a few countries have the geography, number one. Um, number two, they're not, these dams are not everywhere, and so that's gigawatts, not megawatts. No, it's gigawatts, uh, 21,000 gigawatts. And pump storage requires expanded transmission distribution systems, okay? 
So this is an example of what China's building today. Those are the areas. Uh, it's not just in southwestern part of China where their major hydro is, but they're looking everywhere uh, and they're noting that they don't want really long transmission lines because transmission lines are very costly, about a million dollars per gigawatt per mile. <clears throat> so on the yellow is uh, non-reservoir non pumps. Uh, pump storage, non-reservoir storage. Let me talk a little bit about two other things that are being considered, even more so seriously, the flow batteries. The Kanaka one's vanadium, but in the end, uh, that's not going to scale right. And so I just saw last week a very exciting work of uh, Nian Lu, who used to be first a graduate student with Yi Shui, then a co-directed graduate postdoc with me and Yi. And he's working on a zinc flow battery, uh, where he's achieved uh, a conceptual idea that seems to work much longer lived membrane, uh, much cheaper, much higher energy density membrane. The, ob the good thing about uh, flow batteries is the tanks uh, can be huge. Uh, and so you can have a very long storage uh, because it's just you know, negative and positive electrolytes. And the issue always has been the round trip efficiency and the longevity and efficiency of these porous membranes. But uh, some good progress is being made, new ideas. Heat storage also has good scaling because uh, the surface, first of all, we can make very, very good heat insulators and, uh, and it scales properly. So if you go to bigger and bigger thermal storage, uh, it's nice. Um, people have been talking about so-called Carnot engines. You have extra energy in any form, you put it into something hot, and then you want to turn the hot, either use it directly for space building, that's easy, but uh, for industrial purposes, uh, you need uh, to come, come back to electricity because you're not storing super high temperatures. You, you can't get to 1,000 degrees. Okay, so what is new about Bob Laughlin's idea is that as, let's say if you're gonna charge the battery, so you take energy from T1 on the right-hand side, and you pump it to T2, you heat it up. Uh, there's an energy exchanger, and then you're, well, at the same time, you're discharging heat energy at T0 plus and going to T0. Looks a little backward why you want to do this, but it turns out if the turbine is 100% energy efficient and the heat exchanger is 100% energy efficient, this is a reversible reaction. And so in Laughlin's original paper, he predicted 72 per, lower than 72%. Independent people said it could be sick. Really, in reality, given the existing turbines and heat exchangers, it could be 65%. Flow batteries are about 70% currently. They're not that much better. So, so uh, Bob tells me that Siemens is entering into a project agreement to just test this at reasonable scale. But we'll see. Um, Hydrogen. Different colors of hydrogen. There may be a pink or purple hydrogen, but it doesn't matter. The fundamental colors are gray, blue, and green. Gray is you take methane, steam methane reforming. You turn to CO2 and hydrogen. You vent the CO2. You're no better off in greenhouse gases, um, uh, but at least local pollution is much less. Uh, blue hydrogen you do the same steam methane reforming process. You trap the carbon dioxide and sequester it. Let's say under the Inflation Reduction Act has gotten a lot of blue hydrogen players in the market uh, to put uh, hydrogen, uh, put CO2 under uh, the Gulf of Mexico and, and depleted oil reservoirs. Green hydrogen use clean energy, uh, carbon-free, greenhouse gas-free energy, renewables, or nuclear. Okay, so what are the problems? The electrolyzers remain too expensive. Uh, electro electrolysis is inherently a two-dimensional effect. It's a surface area effect measured in amps per square centimeter, or milliamps per square centimeter. And the important thing is actually how much you can produce in a cubic volume uh, because that defines the capital costs. Some very nice ideas coming along to try to get effectively a more three-dimensional aspect to this. Uh, and of course, we need to eliminate some of the uh, metals uh, that are currently used. Um, 
Downside is hydrogen is very, very leaky, much more leaky than natural gas, for example. <clears throat> and it's been determined that if it, it can stay in the atmosphere and keep meth methane from degrading into carbon dioxide, which turns out to be very bad because methane is 84 times worse than carbon dioxide, but only lives there for 20 years, roughly. And with hydrogen, it could double, it could triple it. There's another thing with remote sensing. We've also discovered uh, the hydrogen leaking from oil exploration recovery it was underreported. Uh, you can now just look at the plumes uh, with infrared lasers. But another thing also scary is the natural gas fields themselves are oozing uh, methane. Uh, and the exploration accelerates that. And so there are estimates as high as you know what, switching to natural gas is no better than coal in terms of greenhouse gas emissions. Okay, so that's another bad thing. Um, and finally, we have no good way of detecting hydrogen. Um, the um, mass spectrometry it means you ionize the molecule into atoms and ions, and you bend it in a magnetic field, very expensive detector. There is not, that is not a remote sensor. And it's the remote sensing that's very important. Um, having said that, hydrogen could decarbonize a lot of things. Uh, it can decarbonize a lot in steel, plastics, chemicals, fertilizers, the rest. So, so we, we will probably use it, need it, but we have to be very careful. C commercial batteries uh, for EVs, um, this is energy density per weight and per volume. Uh, they're going to be here in about a decade. I can say this with some confidence because um, I'm the board of a battery company. I do battery research, and we're shipping samples that are up there. And so shipping samples means it could be deployed in 10 years. Uh, not five, um, but 10. Another good news about EV batteries is this is the learning curve. It was just trickling at the very beginning, but in the last uh, lower right-hand side, it's developed a really healthy slope. Uh, the lower number there is $200 per kilowatt hour. It's now about $110 a kilowatt hour. GM has announced in the next four years they don't want to pay above $87 a kilowatt hour for a battery pack. So it is really plunging. And the question is uh, how far it will continue. It depends on a lot of uh, material resources. Already, cobalt and nickel are deemed too expensive. The old OEM manufacturers are going to iron phosphate. Uh, but what about lithium? Lithium is also possible. I might get to that. Let's talk about utility scale batteries. Even though we think we can get enough lithium if mined out of seawater to satisfy the EV market, uh, it won't be enough to satisfy the um, utility scale market worldwide. And so people are looking at much cheaper materials. Zinc is a favorite, sodium possibly, uh, iron, other things. Uh, also aqueous instead of organic because you want safety. You have, imagine these huge farms of these batteries and they could catch fire. With old batteries uh, uh, that we're looking at, there is a perennial coating and that is if you want to use a metal anode, let's say a zinc foil, and you charge too quickly, you form these dendrites. And so people are looking very hard at suppressing dendrites in various ways. Um, this is true of sodium, this is true of zinc. Uh, just uh, a prelude to possible strategies. Uh, this is for a lithium uh, sulfur battery for EVs, uh, not, you know, be zinc and something else. <clears throat> but anyway, the idea here is that when you charge too fast, you create instabilities and little fingers of metal grow. And so if one can produce a barrier uh, that's right on the metal so that the... Um, the, the metal that uh, you're conducting ion can travel easily through the barrier, but it, it's so strong it just suppresses dendrite. So imagine this is right on the surface. Uh, uh, that possibly could work. Um, this is some work that I've been doing with uh, Yang Hai Zhen, who's now uh, a permanent member at Slack, and also with East Wei, uh, where We've taken two-dimensional material, hexagonal boron nitride, it's like graphene. Uh, and when you radiation damage it, you would find that this makes a very, very strong layer, allows uh, 
in this case, the lithium to uh, travel through, but it separates it from the electrolytes and other things. Uh, and, and a half battery, it can go 1,000 cycles without degradation. And in a coin battery, it goes, it's very stable until the electrolyte combines with the metal and the sulfur. That's a known chemistry of the electrolyte we use, and then it crashes. So the good news is if you get a better electrolyte, maybe this would work. Um, but the better news, it can also work in all these other metals that are for aqueous batteries. And so we're going to start working on this uh, because it should be able to filter those as well. One final comment. I'm one or two minutes over. Uh, Chong Lu, when she was here at Stanford, uh, as a postdoc, co-directed with me and Yi, uh, figured out how to extract lithium out of seawater. And the work that she did at Stanford, you get seawater 20,000 to 1 sodium to lithium ratio. And it's a half a battery. It's iron phosphate. And you pass that out the uh, material in that iron phosphate, you find it's 50% um, uh, lithium, which is good enough. Um, however, she went to the University of Chicago as an assistant professor. She uh, got to understand the chemistry and physics a little bit better and can engineer the intercalating compound. So you can use lithium to prime it and squeeze the layers together. So that means that the sodium, the little bit of sodium does not go in, which does ultimately destroy the material. You want to keep the sodium out. And now she's uh, in a ratio of recovery of uh, 10 to 5. That means you start with 1 in 20,000, and you get 7.6 to 1 lithium to sodium. And so that's an example of what's going on with this sort of stuff. This is not polluting, so, and the electricity costs are irrelevant. So if you can make this work many, many thousands, thousand cycles, it could be a way. So with that, there's a lot of things happening, very exciting things in flow batteries. Bob Laughlin's idea may work, and we'll see. Uh, uh, but then meanwhile, the old technology, pump storage, should still <laughs> rule. <laughs> and so it's going to be a mixture of chemical batteries, hydrogen pump storage, and maybe heat storage. Um, uh, and uh, one final thing, the learning curve for pump storage is not the right sign. It's because of political uh, opposition. And um, even our governor in California has had a lot of pressure to tear down hydroelectric dams. So if you can, nudge them to not do that. Thank you. <laughs> I'm doing my best. Good morning. Thank you. Vasna Merkovic with Chevron Technology Ventures. Can you speak a little bit about, is there a trade-off between transmission and storage? Are we going to give up transmission if storage? No, there shouldn't be a trade-off. You're going to need transmission anyway. Uh, and, uh, uh, but transmission's major problem is siting. When I was Secretary of Energy, the time you wanted to site, applied for an application, the time it was built was 11 years. I was trying to get that to three years. Got an agreement, multi-agency agreement. Uh, Ken Zalasar said, fine, you're in charge. We can do this. Uh, an hour after a meeting, he calls me and says, Steve, my people won't back this. They're afraid you might make it happen. And fish and wildlife game don't want their hunting and fishing grounds with transmission lines. So it's, the, there's oppositional politics in a lot of things. And, and, and that, we've got to come over. Yeah, thank you, Stephen Liu, uh, first year undergrad student here. Uh, so I was wondering, there's a lot of worry about um, pump hydro storage not being the cleanest form of energy storage and when the water level goes down and methane comes up from under the ground. So how do you think about this in comparison to other forms of battery storage or other forms of energy well, storage? Well, the water level doesn't actually have to come down. The methane is going to bubble up anyway. And what happens is there is organic debris that goes to the bottom of these reservoirs and there is some anaerobic stuff going on and methane and CO2 come up. Uh, this is of concern. Um, on balance, uh, it's, I personally think there are ways of dealing with this. How do you suppress the organic matter debris so it doesn't make as much methane and uh, CO2 uh, and doesn't do anything untold to the environment? I think that's our best way of doing it. it that's a real issue, but it's not, it, you know, it, 
it, it's not a major issue. Every lake in the world has methane emissions because of that reason. Uh, but but the, if you look at the scorecard of where the methane emission comes from, it's, it's oil and gas exploration, gas leaks, cows burping, and uh, organic waste, food waste, uh, and things like that. Uh, so that's a small part. And of course, rice, in the two weeks it's flooded, it also has methane emission. People are working very hard to figure out how you can modify that to keep the microbes at bay there. Um, and, that, and with that, maybe we can do something about reservoirs. So please join me in thanking Thank you.